want to welcome everyone to the June 1st regular board meeting. Welcome to our student representative, Cornelius Cam Campronero. Did I, did I pronounce your name right? Yes. From Cleveland STEM High School, Mr. Campronero will have an opportunity to provide comments regarding his school later in the meeting. Director Peter will be arriving a little late tonight. Also, Director Pinkham will also be leaving uh, at a, for early, uh, we'll be meet, leaving our meeting early tonight. Ms. Ritchie, the roll call, please. Mr. Blamford. Here. Director Burke. Here. Director Geary. Here. Director Harris. Here. Director Pinkham. Here. Director Patu. Here. If it will, everyone would please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which we stand, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, we would like to recognize those students who will be receiving the seal of bilateral this year literacy this year to speak more on these tremendous accomplishments I would like to invite Michelle Oki International Education Administrator up to the podium thank you very much <laughs> superintendent directors uh, all of my colleagues here at the district parents and students and the wonderful orchestra that we'll be getting to hear from soon uh, my name is Michelle Ansio Aoki. I'm the International Education Administrator, and it's with great pride that I have the opportunity to present to you some representatives from over 299 students who will be earning the seal of biliteracy this year in Seattle Public Schools. The seal of biliteracy is something new. It was a process that began in 2011 in California and has been spreading like wildfire, but Washington was about fourth state, I think, that adopted it. And last year, we had the opportunity to award the seal for the very first time. The seal is really unusual because it recognizes the important role of parents in maintaining their home language with their students. So we have a number of students here tonight that are speakers of Amharic, Somali, Spanish, and Tagalog who all earned uh, credits for those languages and now the seal of biliteracy. There are many more that aren't here as well for Arabic, Burmese, Chinese, French, Korean, Mandarin, Oromo, Polish, Russian, Swahili, Tigrinya, Urdu, and Vietnamese. But in addition, the seal recognizes the students who have really made a long commitment along with their families to language study through high school in international baccalaureate and advanced placement programs. So they have passed those exams and uh, they're here tonight to celebrate. As I mentioned, I think we have over 299 that we've already identified this year, and there'll be more because students who completed their AP and IB exams as seniors will get their results in July, and they'll still get the designation on their diploma and their transcript at that time. So I'd like the students to stand so you can see who they are. Let's give them applause and then come forward. We'll be taking a picture with the school board. So come on forward, and I think what we usually do is kind of stand by the stairs, so line up by the stairs. We'll get a picture with the school board. It's a great opportunity. And then uh, do remember students and families to come back upstairs at 27 to room 2750. This, these kinds of programs are possible because our district is really making a commitment to our English language learner students. We do this in many ways. One is through our dual language immersion programs, but also by sending the message, and I've left some brochures from the Roadmap Project, the Speak Your Language campaign, about how important it is to speak your language. This actually helps with the uh, success, successful development of English and academic achievement. Thank you again.
Now I will turn to Dr. Nyland to provide recognition of staff for their outstanding achievements. All right, we do this a couple of times a year. We've got a lot of uh, staff that have been recognized for a lot of different uh, reasons. Uh, we recognized at our last board meeting our uh, student athletes who uh, had been recognized at the state level. And these are our teachers and our staff and some community members that have been recognized widely in our region, in our state, in our nation. So I think what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to call up a variety of people uh, to do the introductions. And then uh, as we introduce the uh, teachers and staff, I'll ask them to line up right along here until we get uh, all of them introduced. And at that time, I'll invite the board to come down and uh, we'll do a receiving line and let you shake everybody's hand. And then we'll do a group photo uh, up front. So otherwise, it's come down, go back, come down, go back. We'll, we'll see if this works. So. Um, First of all, I'd like to invite uh, Gail uh, Morris uh, or uh, Bernardo. Did you decide? Are you okay, Gail? Hello, I am Gail Morris. I'm Native American Education Services Manager, and I was asked to speak on behalf of Shanna Brown. Uh, Shanna Brown uh, was recently recognized uh, as an exceptional educator at the White House, which was really exciting. She flew out two weeks ago and um, just had the time of her life. But Sh Shanna Brown is a middle school teacher at Broadview Thompson. She teaches ELA and history. And uh, she's also was selected by the U.S. Department of Education and was among several honorees in attendance at the National Teacher of the Year ceremony. She is a full-time social studies teacher and English language arts teacher at Broadview Thompson. And Shanna also serves as a teacher leader in the integration of native history curriculum into K-12 social studies. She is the principal author of Washington State's newly acquired curriculum since time immemorial. It's the, about the 29 federally recognized tribes in the state of Washington. And Shanna and I have conducted many trainings on behalf of Seattle Public Schools the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction, and the National Indian Education Association, the uh, organization that honored her for this honor, award for this honor. Currently, she's working with the Smithsonian Institutional National Museum of the American Indian on their new online initiative, Native Knowledge 360, and I also have the honor of working with her on that. So she is the chief author of that curriculum as well, and we are writing curriculum on the fish wars and the Bolt decision, so it's been really exciting. She, she's, we're working in uh, Washington, D.C., and we're now doing interviews that she has put together. So I'm very proud of her. She's not only a colleague, but she's a great friend of mine, and I've known her since 2003, since this was just an idea in Quilcita with Senator McCoy and the rest of the staff up there. So I'm behalf of Shanna. Not here. Okay. All right. Kim Whitworth. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Kim Whitworth, Executive Director of Schools, and I serve the Northeast. In 1995, I began teaching in the Lake Washington School District. That same year, we had a very young, bright, energetic um, student teacher, and her name was Kristen Bailey. Kristen Bailey uh, taught at Inglewood um, for another six years after that. After that, she was a LA teacher at Ingram High School, an academic specialist at Eckstein Middle School, house administrator at Eckstein Middle School, where she's currently still. Between that time and her first uh, internship at, at Inglewood, she um, got married to Joe Fogarty. She had two lovely daughters, Ruth and Iris. She also teaches classes at Seattle University and has gotten her um, certificate of administration. She's also served as an SEA building rep for the Seattle Public Schools. There are two things that have come from this life experience and this work experience. One is a love and passion for students, and she's well loved by her students. She's also very respected by her colleagues. All of this has enabled her to serve well on the Mayor's Education Summit Planning Committee. We expect to see more leadership and opportunities from Kristen in the future, and we're glad to offer her this award. Recognition. All right, 
don't see her. Uh, Director Patu and uh, I have the opportunity to represent the district along with I think three of our principals and uh, Kristen serves as one of the co-chairs uh, for uh, that work. Brent? Brent Jones. Thank you, Dr. Nyland, Board of Directors. Brent Jones, Chief of Strategy and Partnerships. And today I'd like to recognize Bernardo Ruiz, Director of School and Family Partnerships, Equity and Race Relations. He and his team have received the prestigious Johns Hopkins University of Network Partnerships Schools Award. This was Seattle School's fourth National Partnership Award, which indicates that the district has a strong commitment to improving school, family, and community partnerships to more effectively support our students and their families. Uh, Bernardo, are you here with your team? Introduce your team. Thank you, Dr. Jones. I would like to introduce the team that is um, really worthy of this award, uh, Deborah Alonso. We have Chris Ray, Ray Merriweather. She is the coordinator for the Family University. The two things they um, looked very closely in the, in the award was the Family University. We are one of the only school districts in the nation that offer the Family University in four languages, in Somali, Chinese, Spanish, and English. And I'm very glad to inform you that we strengthened our partnership with North Seattle College to offer advanced lead, uh, leadership development courses that will be credit bearing for the university. And I also like to recognize the leadership of Deborah Alonso. She is one of the, she's actually the, the coordinator for the Spanish speaking cohort. And the team that is not here because they are at schools is Anita Coyer Muamba, Jesse Johnson, Mohamed Roble, and Adi Simmons. And our true goal is to strengthen meaningful school family partnerships to accelerate student learning in Seattle Public Schools. So if you could please give my hand. Good afternoon, Bernardo Ruiz, Director of School Family Partnerships and Equity and Race Relations. It is my true pleasure and honor to introduce Erin Okuno, who is the Executive Director of the Southeast Education Coalition. The Southeast Education Coalition is one of the strongest partners we have in the district that is helping us further racial equity. Erin uh, just recently received the Washington Association of School Administrators Community Recognition Award. Uh, but what she really wanted me to say today is that the work that she's focusing on is to build a movement, to build a legacy, to build sustainability, and to build a coalition of equity leaders that looks for the benefit of every single child that comes into our care. Uh, she, her goal is to bring the community together for the success of each and every one of our children. And so it is my pleasure and an honor to introduce Aina Kuno. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Aaron. I get to uh, introduce uh, Cassandra Johnson. Uh, not only has she served uh, admirably as Seattle Council PTSA president this last year, but she came in uh, with this uh, drive and determination and singular focus to increase uh, food security uh, for our students. And she uh, figured out the numbers. Uh, most of us, like myself, we uh, look at the numbers and we see something like 34% of our students uh, qualify for free and reduced lunch. Uh, and Cassandra did the math and said, wow, that is 15,000 students. And what do they do on the weekend when uh, school's not in session and they don't have food? She came to uh, SLI, the uh, Summer uh, Leadership Institute, and uh, put the arm on our principals. Uh, worked with food banks, I don't know how many there are, a dozen or more uh, across the city, got them enlisted, went to uh, Leadership Tomorrow, got them uh, to figure out how to help, went to the city of Seattle, got them to figure out how they could help, and uh, I don't know the exact number, but I'd say that it's about 5,000 additional students that uh, are enjoying uh, at least some uh, food, uh, food uh, backpacks that they get on Friday. Uh, for uh, food over the weekend. So uh, I'd like to recognize uh, Cassandra and uh, thank her for her great leadership.
it's been a pleasure to do this role and to help our students and families. And uh, we just are not finished with it. It's a three-year commitment, really, to try to eliminate student weekend food insecurity for every student in the city of Seattle. And we have made great progress, and we hope to continue in the next couple of years. And I'd like to introduce uh, Flip Herndon, Associate Superintendent for Facilities. Good evening, Flip Herndon, Associate Superintendent of Facilities and Operations. Um, tonight we will be honoring uh, Cleveland as a, an award winner for the STEM Lighthouse uh, presentation. So if we have Mr. CJ Dancer here from OSPI, I'm hoping. If not, okay, then uh, I do see uh, some other folks from uh, Cleveland that could come up here and speak about this. The STEM Lighthouse Award is uh, just a fantastic award to receive. I know there's a lot of hard work involved. So we have uh, Principal uh, George Breland here and looks like he's holding the award in his hands. Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, esteemed board members. Uh, I wasn't prepared to speak, but uh, we have a banner here, Ms. Lois Brewer and my assistant principal, uh, Ray Morales. And uh, we are uh, definitely excited about the STEM Lighthouse Award and the work that's been done. Actually, the students uh, have done in science, technology, engineering, and math. So uh, we're just excited where we're going where we came from, and uh, we continue to work hard. And it, I'm just a figurehead, so it's all these people right here who make me look good, and these people. Thank you. Thank you all. I'd like to invite all of our recipients to come uh, up front, and I'd like to invite the board members to come down, and uh, maybe uh, we'll go through a receiving line, and then we'll all uh, gather on the front steps here as we did uh, for the uh, last photo. So thank you again to all of our uh, recognized individuals. Okay, our student presentation tonight is, we, tonight we have Cleveland High School Symphonic Orchestra performing for us. The Cleveland High School Music Program is in the process of rebuilding and has a long way in just one short year. The Symphonic Orchestra is the school's premier ensemble comprised of 21 student grades 9 through 12 and is projected to double in size for the 2016-17 school year. Tonight, they will be performing music that is advanced even for high school ensembles. The director, Ms. Malarkey, has noted that this group has worked extremely hard this year and has shown phenomenal progress. Please join me in welcoming the Cleveland High Symphonic Orchestra. <laughs> Can all directors please uh, sit in the audience?
Uh, thank you very much. We would like to thank the school board members and the members of the district who invited us down here to perform for you all. Uh, that was one of the pieces from our very first concert this year. Uh, next, we're going to play one of the pieces from our upcoming concert. We would love to invite all of you there, and we want you to hear some new music. So this will be the only one we're going to perform from that concert, so that you can be surprised for the next concert if you come, which I hope you all do. Next Thursday <laughs> at 6.30. <laughs> Thank you. 
So again, uh, we're the Cleveland STEM High School uh, Symphonic Orchestra. This is our premier group. There are 21 students involved in this group. Next year, there is um, s scheduled to be over 40. Um, it's gonna be tough fitting them all in our room, but uh, we're gonna do our best. Um, they have worked extremely hard this year, um, and I cannot be more proud of their progress and their performance. Um, they are an exemplar of student work at its finest. Um, we will be playing one more piece for you tonight, uh, The Barber of Seville. I'm sure many of you will recognize it, if nothing else, from Bugs Bunny. Um, <laughs> it is Bugs Bunny op Opera. So here we go. This is our last piece for you this evening. Uh, we hope you enjoy. That was an amazing performance. Let's give Cleveland High Symposium Orchestra another great hand. Thank you so much. Also, I want to thank our uh, director, Ms. McCar Malarkey, for doing a great job. And uh, what I want to do is actually give you the mic and uh, say your name and grade and then pass it on to the next student. Um. <laughs> I'm Carly. I'm in 10th grade. I'm Anisha. I'm in 10th grade. I'm Zainab, I'm in 10th grade. 
I'm Melanda, I'm in ninth grade. I'm a Kim, and I'm in 10th grade. I'm Leona, I'm in 10th grade. I'm Diana, I'm in 11th grade. I'm Christine, I'm in 11th grade. My name is Christensen, I am in 10th grade. I'm Mina, I'm in 10th grade. I'm Catalina, I'm in 9th grade. I'm Anna, and I'm in 9th grade. I'm Mia, and I'm in 9th grade. I'm Alex, I'm in 12th grade. I'm Justin, I'm in 10th grade. I'm Malik, I'm in uh, 11th grade. I'm Oscar, I'm in 9th grade. I'm Gina, I'm in 11th grade. I'm Shine, I'm in 9th grade. I'm Jenny, and I'm in 9th grade. I'm Jonathan, and I'm in 10th uh, grade. Uh, I'm Hannah, I'm in 10th grade. I'm Nicholas, and I'm in 11th grade. And I'm Carolyn, and I'm in 11th grade. Let's give him another great one for applause. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a really amazing performance. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will now turn it over to Superintendent Nyland for his comments. Well, again, our thanks to uh, Cleveland High School Symphonic Orchestra. Their story uh, is uh, got a backstory to it that they didn't have an orchestra in 2008 uh, with the uh, implementation of the neighborhood assignment uh, program in the district. The board authorized uh, a building out of the district uh, music program across the district. And uh, over the uh, last several years, the Visual and Performing Arts Department has worked with music teachers to develop uh, 20 K-12 programs. Cleveland was one of those uh, programs. They uh, received funding for band and orchestra instruments under the leadership of Ms. Mori, the previous music director, uh, and a passionate, dedicated student, Robert Babs, who's now a graduate of the University of Washington and the orchestra was launched during lunch and advisory hours. Numerous community partners, Seattle Youth Symphony Orchestra and others supported the enhanced lessons and eventually turned the program into a thriving uh, example that we saw here tonight. And it sounds like it's uh, still uh, on the grow. Um, so on behalf of uh, the district and uh, our board, I want to thank uh, Pam Ivizic uh, from our district uh, staff for her mission, uh, vision to build out the music courses, Ms. Mori, for the dedication and determination to get started, our former student, Robert Babs, uh, and uh, our director here tonight, uh, Ms. Malarkey, for uh, continuing to grow a strong uh, orchestra program. I certainly never played the violin anywhere near that well in my career, so <laughs> congratulations to our students. Current issues uh, underway. Uh, kindergarten is uh, ready to launch for a lot of changes uh, this fall. Uh, for the first time under uh, state support, we'll be able to offer free kindergarten, all day kindergarten, to all of our uh, students across the district and across the state. 
uh, which uh, is uh, very exciting. And at the same time, uh, I want to say that Washington is something like 36th in the nation to get on board with uh, all day uh, kindergarten. So certainly an idea whose time has come. A lot, a lot of things will be underway for kindergarten students this fall. Uh, I think starting with uh, a jump start opportunity for kindergarten students to come see what school might be like when they actually start school in the fall. Uh, the actual start of the kindergarten um, daily instruction will be three days delayed uh, from other students across the district. That'll give our uh, teachers an opportunity to meet with the uh, students and their families to get acquainted and to get off to a, a strong start when school does open. And then uh, as part of the state funding, uh, something called WA Kids uh, goes with it, which is a fairly detailed uh, inventory uh, assessment of student uh, skills, uh, academic as well as social emotional. And that'll take place during the first uh, eight weeks of school. So uh, it'd be an exciting time for our kindergarten students. And certainly part of a stronger pipeline uh, to have st kindergarten students have uh, that extra boost uh, to get ready for uh, first grade. Our Bell Times uh, Task Force uh, operated all of last year and uh, worked through a process to make a later start possible for our high schools. Uh, and that meant an earlier start for many of our elementary schools. Uh, they did come forward with a I don't know what we'd call it, maybe a two and a half tier uh, plan. Uh, we could not uh, fully get to a two tier uh, plan due to the cost, but uh, the team continued to work. Uh, and uh, what we said is the board finalized the uh, assignment of bell times uh, a few uh, weeks ago was that uh, we would try to accommodate as many of the tier three schools as possible to move them uh, into either tier one or tier two. That really depended on the number of buses uh, that were involved and uh, then we also looked at the free and reduced lunch uh, count for, the, um, for those schools. Uh, the staff was here working uh, over our three-day weekend and they were able to move uh, two of the schools, uh, Gatsert and uh, Lafayette, into uh, one of the other tiers. I think that re we still have about a dozen, maybe 11 uh, schools remaining in uh, tier three. So uh, a lot of work to come as uh, those routes get put together for the fall. Uh, we do have a communication uh, plan being rolled out uh, to notify parents that uh, right now the excitement is on the end of the school year and then we'll go into summer vacation and then it'll be, oh, school's starting. Uh, and uh, we want families to know and remember over the summer that uh, there will be different start times as we start the year uh, in the fall. Meanwhile, uh, we've had a task force working on 24 credits. Right now our students can take only 24 credits in a regular schedule, six periods uh, per day for a four-year high school career, meaning that in order to earn the now required 24 credits for high school graduation, they could not miss a single course. The task force considered several uh, options seven period day, eight period day, eight period block schedule, which would be four periods per day, uh, five period day on a trimester. And that was uh, where they ended up with their recommendation. That's kind of the beginning of the process. So over the coming uh, not too many months, we'll need to bargain that with uh, SEA and we'll need to continue to work on the cost factors uh, involved. I think that the five period trimester is kind of in the middle of the uh, cost considerations uh, in the two to five million dollar range, uh, which is um, at one hand very reasonable. Uh, at another hand, uh, moving into a year when McCleary is uncertain and we're uh, already scheduled to be short on funding, uh, that's uh, a concern. So a lot of work to be done over the next uh, several uh, weeks and months on 24 credits. The good news is it will uh, provide more opportunity in student schedules both to graduate on time and to take more of the electives or STEM or CTE uh, courses that um, 
uh, students have had less opportunity to do with our really tight uh, schedule. Smarter Balanced uh, assessments are wrapping up. The end of the window is June 3rd. Uh, today is June 1st, so uh, just about done. I've been uh, surprised as I uh, have been doing my school visits that about half of the schools uh, in the last week or so have already been sharing with me their preliminary results. So uh, I was skeptical a year ago and they said that they were gonna get results back to us in three weeks and that didn't happen last year. But uh, this year, uh, it looks like uh, that's happening on a much uh, quicker basis, and we're gearing up trying to get at least uh, preliminary information to parents uh, before uh, school is out. So with however many, I guess that's about half of our students, 25,000 students, we'll see how well we can do it getting that information out before school ends. Um, meanwhile, um, we uh, did have to impose on principals. We had let them know a couple of uh, weeks or months ago that we would need a plan from them on increasing participation rates. Uh, and then in the uh, intervening weeks, uh, OSBI was placed on their high risk status. And then OSBI sent us an urgent memo saying that we had to get that information into them uh, much more uh, quickly than the initial communication had said. So it uh, was at the time, it was about six weeks that they gave us to get that information in. A Couple of uh, issues under capital and capacity management. Uh, Cedar Park, um, Cedar Park currently is housing uh, Olympic Hills uh, while their uh, school is being uh, rebuilt and then Cedar Park will remain open and uh, boundaries will shift. Uh, as we've gone through the last uh, year or so, uh, there's been, uh, I think, two issues. One issue is uh, what about the diversity and how is that going to play out for uh, Cedar Park and the surrounding schools? And secondly, uh, is there enough room at Cedar Park for the students who now live in that attendance area? We now know that uh, there's not enough room at Cedar Park uh, for the students assigned there, so there will need to be a boundary uh, redraft. Um, and uh, Dr. Herndon and the uh, staff is working uh, through that process to consider those alternatives. Uh, likewise, under uh, Loyal Heights, uh, there's been a, a, a pretty uh, steady interest on the part of parents uh, to see if there's something else that we can do there. Uh, and um, at this point in time, uh, we are implementing the plan that the board uh, put in place, I think in 2013, with regard to the size of the school, uh, the attendance area, and basically recognizing that uh, we're building out virtually all of our properties uh, in the district to make room for uh, the students that we have. So. Changing that design at this point in time w uh, would be costly. It would delay the project and uh, I think it would save a floor, but it wouldn't save on the footprint for uh, the building. Meanwhile, uh, enrollment projections uh, continue to be refined uh, for the coming year and uh, we'll be uh, rolling out those updates in the next uh, few days and looking at what that means for staffing. We've also been looking at the issue of K-3 staffing and the, it's not quite right to call it McCleary, but uh, the staffing guidelines that the legislature has given to us. Uh, and we think that there'll be a little bit more wiggle room for us than uh, what we had once feared. Uh, we will need to ensure that kindergarten classes are smaller than uh, grades one through three and grades one through three are smaller than grades four and five. Uh, we're hopeful that that won't have quite the impact on uh, combination or split classrooms that we once uh, were worried about. We are uh, moving into negotiation season. Uh, we did bargain last year with SEA and we agreed on a three-year contract. Part of that contract called for uh, reopeners for the 24 credits and the 20 minute longer school day. So we'll be talking about those issues with SEA. PASS, our principals association, their three year contract expires uh, this year. And so we're in conversations with them about renewing their contract. And then uh, 
trades and carpenters are open for negotiation this summer and 609 has uh, a reopener for the um, $15 minimum wage and any work changes associated with the change <laughs> in bell times. Part of the enrollment uh, and staffing issue is uh, every year we try to get creative about how we utilize staff. Um, part of our concern last year was that we um, pulled back 25 staff from school, at, from students, from schools after school started. And so the request from uh, the board and from the community was, uh, can we find a way to make that not happen? So we tried diligently, uh, but part of the price for making that happen is that we have about a dozen schools, uh, center school, uh, quite a few of our K-8 schools, who are uh, reminding us that they get mitigation funds every year, and that's the only way that they feel that they can operate their schedule. So we're now in this dilemma about, hmm, do we fund the schools at the level that they believe that they need to be at, which is a little bit richer than other schools get, uh, and or do we uh, continue with our uh, attempt to protect schools from loss of enrollment after school starts uh, in the fall? We have noticed uh, in the last few days that some of our uh, school websites say that school ends on the 23rd and some say that school ends on the 24th. Um, uh, left over from uh, the change that we had to make uh, after the uh, after we resumed the start of school after the strike in the fall. Sad to say school does end on the 24th, not the 23rd. <laughs> so uh, we will be uh, getting that communication out and I believe that we are, uh, if we haven't already done so, updating uh, the websites for the schools and uh, putting on those websites the uh, bell times uh, for them uh, this coming fall. We're also gearing up for uh, summer learning, summer staircase, uh, extend, expanding the number of sites that we have this year. We're uh, always pleased to partner with the city and with a lot of our community partners to offer academics, uh, AM, uh, fun activities, PM, uh, and uh, identify students that have the greatest need. One of the research uh, components says that schools do a pretty good job of making sure that every student gets a year's worth of learning during the year. Uh, and then uh, students that need the learning the most sometimes plateau over the summer uh, or slide back a little bit over the summer because uh, school's not uh, in session and they don't have access to as many of those enrichment opportunities. So. Um, we'd love to do even more, but delighted to be able to offer more uh, in the summer learning program. School visits uh, and uh, related activities and since the last board meeting, um, several of us had the opportunity to be here in this room for the Seattle Schools uh, Scholarship uh, Fund. So uh, Directors Patu and Harris were here and uh, had the opportunity to recognize, I think it was 27 of our uh, seniors for scholarship awards. Uh, thanks so much for the, uh, those who make the scholarship fund work and our, I think they're contributed and helped out by our uh, Seattle School Retirees Association. They increased the scholarships this year, I think from 2000 to 2500 and they uh, added a few uh, more scholarships. So every student had a compelling story to tell about some of the challenges and hardships that they had uh, overcome. Had the opportunity to be at the annual All Achiever Awards at Rainier Beach. Uh, Seattle Breakfast Group uh, presented scholarships in recognition to about 40 of our African American male uh, students. Uh, and again, uh, they just do a great uh, job of providing tutors. Uh, I think they operate in five of our high schools now. Uh, Project Mister provides a mentor uh, for the students and then they gave out a lot of scholarship awards. Also recently, uh, the showcase of success for uh, many of our uh, STEM uh, teachers occurred at the Grand Hyatt, uh, sponsored by the Washington Alliance for Education. Some of our teachers were there showcasing their work and some of them were featured on uh, uh, television that night as they talked about their, uh, their projects. Rainier View um, was uh, busy hanging one of their new uh, recognition banners uh, when, it, when I was there. 
Uh, they've uh, worked probably as well or better than any of our schools uh, being just uh, absolutely intentional about the quality of their instruction and the use of data and this uh, belief that each and every student uh, will uh, do well. South Shore, uh, which is our only pre-K through grade eight uh, school, they pioneered the preschool work and now has been picked up by uh, Seattle, City of Seattle saw the idea and the voters voted for that. Uh, they've been working on positive growth mindsets and cultural uh, responsiveness. Dunlap, uh, the principal there, vir greeted virtually every student we came across uh, in our visit uh, by name. Uh, they've been working with Page Ahead, uh, who've been providing books for each of our students. And uh, they, as well as many of our other, other schools, were busily working on uh, young authors. And they were one of the schools that had gotten their SBA data back, and we we're encouraged to see uh, double digit growth in many of their grades. Green Lake uh, Elementary is a multi graded open concept school. And wow, uh, kindergarten has space for two classrooms, and they have three in there. Uh, their pods are designed for three, and one of them has four classrooms now, and another one will have four classrooms uh, next year. So they're squeezing in even more classrooms than uh, the building was uh, designed for and being very creative in uh, reusing space uh, everywhere. Uh, Sandpoint Elementary, I think, uh, gives, um, hmm, I don't know what to say. Uh, so we, we very much appreciate the partnership that we have with the city in many, many, many ways, and most recently around closing the opportunity gap. Uh, visiting Sandpoint uh, means that we need a little microcosm planning team from the city and the school district. Uh, the staff and the PTA have been working diligently with uh, the nearby public housing uh, to try to figure out how to uh, handle uh, the increase in enrollment for uh, public housing and for an international community of uh, students that attend uh, the University of Washington. Um, so between those two, uh, they've had a lot of challenges. The P PTA has stepped up to provide funding for some of the additional staff, but the staff that they do have is uh, kind of picking up work that normally might have been done by the city uh, or through some of the other social agencies that haven't quite moved that far out to catch up with uh, the uh, public housing at Sandpoint. View Ridge uh, Elementary working hard on aligning their curriculum and uh, common formative assessments, uh, implementing ruler for the first year. And it was, uh, we're nearing the end of the school year, so uh, some of my visits were kind of cut short with pajama day or uh, flash curriculum, uh, which is our sex ed curriculum or other, uh, other, other events underway. Seattle World School is just an amazing place. 310 students speaking 35 languages, uh, virtually all of them newly immigrated within uh, maybe just at the beginning of their high school career and uh, working hard to uh, be ready to graduate. This will be their second uh, graduating uh, class. And uh, McGilvra Elementary, kind of as I walked into the building, I had been there before, but it's kind of like, hmm, those pine floors look familiar. And then when I saw the cloak rooms, it was kind of like, hmm. So I came back, looked in the book, and sure enough, I think it was built in 14 or 15, and my elementary school, Broadview, was built in the opposite year, 14 or 15. So as many of our schools in Seattle, uh, sister floor plans, uh, I felt right at home. Um, so they've been working on mindsets, uh, MTSS interventions, uh, and some uh, co-teaching with their uh, coaches. And tonight, uh, you know, he's already lost him. Uh, Stephen uh, Nielsen, our deputy superintendent, is representing us at a, a town meeting sponsored by the Seattle Times on McCleary and state funding. Uh, also there will be representatives from the Paramount Duty Coalition, League of Education Voters, uh, legislators on both sides of the aisle, and some of our neighboring uh, school districts. So uh, we appreciate uh, the Times and uh, others who are beginning to draw attention to the fact that the clock really is ticking now on uh, McCleary and the legislature's commitment and promise four times uh, to have their work done by April 1st now uh, of 2017 and do what they promised to do back in, I think it was 2009, uh, so we'll see. 
uh, in the news today, I believe, is a Kansas uh, Supreme Court decision saying that the legislature uh, has to get their funding right or school won't open. Uh, so uh, they've reached the end of their uh, judicial uh, <laughs> opportunities there and are saying you have to fix this and you have to fix this now. A uh, couple of final comments. Uh, good news, um, recovery school. Uh, MTV came and uh, featured the interagency recovery uh, school as part of a documentary that they're doing on promising practices to support young people who've struggled with addition, uh, addiction. Um, wow, so the <laughs> uh, touring our school with uh, Macklemore, uh, one of our former students, uh, and uh, providing support for the uh, school there show will be showed uh, shown aired in uh, in August um, US News uh, best high schools uh, recognized uh, three of Seattle Public Schools high schools in their uh, top of the 2016 US News best high schools uh, report uh, Roosevelt number six uh, Garfield number seven and Ingram uh, number nine um, White House uh, invitation, um, the White House uh, under the President and the First Lady have uh, been advocating, as have many, for the elimination of the opportunity gap. Um, a number of years ago, uh, he called a group together for uh, something called My Brother's Keeper. Uh, the Council of Great City Schools was uh, involved in some of that early work uh, and then not too long ago, Mia Williams uh, was at the White House representing Seattle as one of the first districts uh, to support uh, the work. And on June 8th, uh, we've been invited uh, to support the expansion of that uh, effort to another uh, 20 uh, school districts uh, across the nation. And um, the Global Reading Challenge, uh, we have uh, a wonderful gift from uh, the Seattle Public Libraries. Uh, they're one of the few uh, large city districts that continues to support the uh, Global Reading Challenge under uh, our head librarian. They've built out the program. So this year I believe that they were in all, whatever it is, 68 or 70 of our elementary and K-8 schools. And they provided uh, books for up to 10 teams from each school. I I think if I do my math right, that's about 4,000 books that they provide to us. Uh, students compete. Uh, and uh, get recognized uh, across the city of Seattle. Uh, I had the opportunity along with the deputy mayor and the head of the Seattle libraries to uh, go to Thornton Creek uh, yesterday and recognize the book thieves, uh, which was the winning team from uh, Thornton Creek. And wow, uh, the kids, you just could not get a word in edgewise. They were talking about the competition, how many times they read the book, what was the best part of the book, who had the right answer, who didn't have the right answer, what they were going to do to compete for next year. So it's just great to see that kind of uh, enthusiasm uh, for reading. And finally, uh, some staffing changes. Um, Carmen Rahm, uh, head of our technology department, uh, his last day uh, was yesterday. Uh, he's moving to uh, Kent, which is closer to home. So uh, we'll miss him. Uh, for the time being, the two directors that have been reporting to Carmen uh, will be reporting to Stephen Nielsen, the deputy superintendent, as we work through the process of replacing uh, Carmen. And uh, tonight we uh, welcome uh, Carrie Campbell in the role of chief uh, engagement officer. She's moving over from uh, the partnership work that she's been doing in the district. And so she knows us, she knows uh, our system, uh, and uh, we look forward to working with her to uh, improve uh, what we've been doing with regard to communications. That concludes my remarks. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, now it's our student comments. Again, welcome to Cornelius Campronero from Cleveland Stamp High School. Mr. Campronero is the newly elected ASB president for the 2016-17 school year. He is a member of the Black Student Union and plays on the Frisbee team. His goal for his reign as president is to have the senior class step into more leadership roles to make underclassmen feel welcome to share ideas. 
Hi, good evening. Um, in the past three years at Cleveland High School, there's been nothing but hard work and dedication from all staff, teachers, and students um, who are on one simple mission. Our mission at Cleveland is to give every student of all backgrounds the opportunity to succeed. And as a student attending a school in the south end of Seattle, I've experienced struggles and seen my peers go through life-changing events every single day. At Cleveland, we are not just a community, we're a family. We look out for each other and support each other every step of the way. And as an upcoming senior, I know the tradition will carry on for many more years to come and that Cleveland will remain to be an example for what a STEM school should be. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Campanero. Um, now we are, have reached the consent portion of tonight's agenda. May I, have, may I have a motion for the consent agenda? I move approval of the, of the consent agenda. Second. Approval of the consent agenda has been moved and second. Do directors have any items they would like to remove from the consent agenda? Director Harris. Madam President, I'd like to move uh, number three, recommendation to the contract extension for first students for the 2016-17 school year. Off the consent agenda. So now we will vote. Uh, second. Now we will vote for the consent agenda. As amended? Hmm. Is that correct? Don't we have to vote on it first and then? Don't we vote on it first before we? Yes, it would be a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended. Okay. I motion to approve the consent agenda as amended. Do I hear a second? Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so what are we? Uh, and now Director Peters would read the motion for the first student contract into the record. Number three, first student. Um, okay, here it is. Okay, I move that the superintendent be authorized to execute a contract extension with first student with a 2.5% CPI increase, accepting the proposed fee structure and extending the contract by one year in the form of the draft amendment dated May 18, 2016 with any minor additions, deletions, and modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent and to take any necessary actions to implement the contract extension. Second the motion. Okay, I'd like to call on the committee chair to, uh, for the committee's recommendation on this item. That's right. I'm sorry about the delay. Um, this item was discussed by the Operations Committee on May the 3rd and we was moved to the full board with a recommendation for approval. Is there any uh, questions or comments? Director Harris? Thank you, Madam President. As I indicated on the introduction at the last board meeting, I have grave concerns about the benefits we pay our bus drivers through this contract with respect to their health benefits. I'd much rather see us renegotiate and treat our folks that are 
a valuable part of our team with more respect as opposed to rolling it down the road for another year. So I will therefore be voting no. Thank you. Any more questions or comments from any of the board directors? Okay, Ms. Ritchie, can you uh, call the vote? Director Peters. Aye. Director Pinkham. Aye. Director Blanford. Aye. Director Burke. Aye. Director Geary. Aye. Director Harris. No. Director Patu. Aye. This motion has passed six to one. No time is it? Okay, we've come to our board comments. And I'm going to ask Scott to go ahead and go first since we're at the lead. Uh, Katsuyo, uh, Tasukawa, good evening. Uh, <coughs> for me, I guess I first want to start off with uh, definitely thanking the Cleveland uh, Symphonic Orchestra for the performance and uh, congratulations on also on the high school receiving their award as a STEM school and, and definitely sounds like they're on the way to be a STEAM school uh, as well now that they've got the Symphonic Orchestra to, <coughs> to include with their accomplishments. Uh, Congratulations to, to also all the staff that received recognition tonight. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to Shanna Brown. Uh, sorry I wasn't able to be there uh, when you were recognized, I think a couple of weeks ago at your school, but uh, for myself, I, I can't say that, you know, enough to about what you contributed as we look at the since time memorial curriculum and where the schools are heading to recognize the indigenous people of this area. Uh, <coughs> for, let me see, I. Just also want to quickly announce, I will be having a community meeting uh, this Saturday from 4 to 5.30 at Broadview uh, Library. So for those that uh, not think it made it to the agenda for this uh, <coughs> school board, but yeah, I was kind of hemming high enough I'd be able to do it, but I am going to go ahead and go with that uh, community meeting this Saturday, again, from 4 to 5.30 at Broadview uh, Library. And the reason I was kind of hemming high on I have a niece that's graduating. <laughs> So she has a graduation party that day, so I have to apologize to her. I'm going to be there late, but I will be there. Uh, and right now, for me, that's the comments that I have. And let's. Thank you. We have Director Harris. Remember that today the Supreme Court has levied fines against the legislature that totaled $28.9 million. To me, that's a profound number. Um, I will be voting yes for the uh, program placement this evening, but I do have major concerns about how we address and place our special ed population. <coughs> um, updates. A huge amount of email on various topics. And we see them, and we hear you, and we'd like to be more transparent 
in our responses, but this is definitely the center of the law of unintended consequences. <coughs> if details aren't firmed up, it would be <coughs> irresponsible to daylight certain situations. So it's very, very much a trust exercise, a trust exercise between board members and staff, board members and the, and the community, but please be assured that we hear you with respect to issues of Middle College High School and meetings have been had and will continue to be had so that we can get this very valuable program reset and working towards the future because our kids are not in fact widgets they are not in fact throwaways and we are committed to making that happen and special thanks to associate superintendent tolly for taking your time and for having very candid and sometimes difficult conversations on that so stay tuned schmitz park we've known for three years that it would be a vacant school in september i am very pleased to tell you that we will, with the assistance of partners, be offering childcare there, probably expanded childcare. That school will not be bordered up and subjected to vandalism and know that this issue has trans transpired over several different, what we call silos here with folks working together. So again, stay tuned. And for those of you all that remember Schmitz Park Elementary, 6.30 Friday night, party. All of the alumni at Schmitz Park Elementary and the West Seattle community and anybody else that wants to come down and share their reminiscence is most invited and and it will be a celebration of the good things that the Seattle Public Schools do. The Seattle Preschool Partnership Task Force met last week. It's an awesome crew working very hard with a very gifted facilitator. Notes and documents will be uploaded to the website, I'm told, by next week so that you can follow along. They have a deadline of December. They have subgroups that will start forming so we can talk about issues of equity and issues of financing and jurisdictional respect with the city of Seattle. Those are all good things. Uh, other issues working on the Chinese pathway, Chinese language pathway at West Seattle High School and Madison Middle School. Very important because we've got feeder schools that are teaching Chinese, but once they get to West Seattle High School, there is not currently planned to be a Chinese teacher there. So those pathways are real tricky and of course the weighted staffing standard formula as well as the lack of money. IB funding for all three schools, not just Rainier Beach High School, and working out the details of the Alliance for Education grant, some of the miscommunications, and uh, I'm sorry that Stephen Nielsen is not here tonight because he could speak directly to that issue. Stay tuned, we're working hard, we hear you loud and clear, and keep those emails coming. My next community meeting will be on Saturday, June 11th from 3 to 4.30 at the High Point Library. That's 35th Avenue Southwest in Southwest Raymond. The next meeting would be July 16th at the Southwest, excuse me, the High Point Library for the 11th. July 16th will be at the Southwest Library again from 3 to 4.30. Um, the scholarship fund recognition was awe-inspiring. We've got some photographs that uh, we hope to have up on the web soon. Next year we need to video it because after listening to these young people's stories and hearing from their counselors and their teachers and their principals, it, it will give me enough juice to get through the next year's worth of frustrations. It was that inspiring. And, and these are young people that have gone well and above beyond and, and we need to celebrate and be proud of them. Last two asks, please fill out the web survey that's on 
our home page. We've heard lots about what you don't like. We need to know what you do want. And second, please apply for the capacity task force. Policy is made by people that show up and put themselves in a chair. And, and this is an exciting thing to bring forward folks from all over to address the future because capacity is driving what we do now and for the next 15 years. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. We are now um, into our public testimony. The rules for public testimony are on the screen and I would ask that speakers are respectful of these rules. I would note that the board does not take public comments on issues related to personnel or individually named staff. I would also like to note that each speaker has a two minute speaking time. When the two minutes have ended, please conclude your remarks. I will say the first three names, Ronnie Estacu, Savannah Jamerson and Chris Jenkins. Hello. Hi, thank you for having me today to speak to you guys. Uh, I'm a junior finishing up my year at Cleveland High School and I've enjoyed my opportunity there. I've been attending since my freshman year. And today I'm gonna be talking about how I was uh, displaced for the next school year. So during the summer I moved to Berrien, so that, that made it so that I couldn't attend or be enrolled into the school for next year. So I'm currently in the process of reapplying for the school and I definitely love my uh, experience at Cleveland. I love the people, I love the staff, I love the administration, and it's been a great opportunity for me. Cleveland currently has room for 900 students, and right now only 820 are enrolled. If we were to fill Cleveland to capacity, that means that we could have more teachers to offer more course load for students and have that opportunity available to our students. Cleveland is an option school, but some students don't have the opportunity to apply to the school because of their location. And I've been at the school for three years, and I believe that I should have the right to be attending next year for my senior year. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Your proposal to amend policy in order to share responsibility for the fate of school programs returns to citizens the representative voice we entrusted in you. Thank you for taking this action. As a former teacher of the original middle college, I have been struggling with other community members for over a year to defend the former middle college model. Without school board oversight, our voices have been rendered annoying complaints rather than experiential, insightful, collaborative viewpoints. My support is not merely nostalgic. It is rational and intellectual. My recent graduate studies in multicultural education at the University of Washington repeatedly reaffirmed the social justice, anti-racist, and critical praxis of former middle college model. Consistent with Geneva Gay's theories, a culturally relevant learning culture of caring was marked by vigorous and college preparatory praxis, not pity. This signaled to students that they were being taken with respect and seriousness for their potential. It was a holistic approach, internalizing the discipline of habits of work and habits of mind needed to succeed beyond high school and in life. Consistent with James Banks' highest approach to multicultural education, Teaching and learning was guided by Paulo Fieri's Education for Critical Consciousness. In the process of critical thinking, students reflected on their own internalized thinking and became critically introspective and retrospective about self and the world. Shifting from objects to subjects of their realities, students became transformed and many agents of change. Without your oversight and input, Middle College at High Point was abruptly closed and the IDB Well School was reverted into more traditional approaches from which many students flee. An equitable education opportunity for, for Seattle schools underserved high school students who feel disconnected Please from conclude school your remarks. no longer exists. Thank you for your Thank time. You.
My name is Chris Jackins, Box 84063, Seattle 98124, on amending school closure and other policies. Thank you for addressing these issues. Two points. Number one, in terms of state law, school closures mean school site closures. The courts established this meaning during appeals which I helped bring against past school closures. The proposed policy incorrectly assigns a different process to site closures than to school closures. Number two, the school board needs to actually fix things, reverse the closures of schools like Middle College at High Point, Indian Heritage, and African American Academy. On amending board procedure 1430, audience participation. Three points. Number one, the policy would give elected officials a special early speaking slot. The general public might resent such special privileges. Number two, student speakers would be grouped at the start of the agenda. Similarly, segregating speakers by racial group might give some people pause. Number three, the policy seeks to prohibit, quote, ridicule, unquote. Please define ridicule. Please vote no on these changes. On the concerns of the deaf and hard of hearing community, please have staff respond publicly to these concerns. On the resolution on testing, a board member pointed out that the resolution cited incorrect racial percentages. Please resume publication of the annual data profile report so the board can better address such issues. On the Loyal Heights project, at least four board members have publicly stated concerns about this project. Please take immediate action to halt and fix this project. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sally Soriano, Rosalind Schill, Erin Okuna. Hi, I'm Sally Soriano, and I'd like to comment on the proposed policy amendments which would give this school board oversight of district educational programming. It seems that this school district has been demonstrating to the Seattle community that what is legitimate is what comes from top-down autocratic decision-making, but regards the experiences or growth that occurs in a classroom as having little value. This has created incredible turmoil in the Indian Heritage community, the Middle College High Point community, and the special ed at original Van Aslet community. At the last board meeting, one board member said he conducted an informal scientific poll with his former board colleagues. He told us that they disagreed that there was any need for increased board oversight of district programming because it was not within the governing role of the board. I think possibly a more scientific poll would be what Seattle constituents voted for in November 2015 when they overwhelmingly elected four new school board candidates who had all campaigned for increased collaborative school board decision making, a resounding mandate for more transparency and accountability. I also agree with the reasoning stated in the public testimony last, at the last meeting that special education programming must be included in these amendments as well. In 2004, research psychologist and educator Gerald Bracey spoke right here in this room. In his book published in 2003, The War Against America's Public Schools, Bracey wrote, public schools provide public forums for discussing the critical issues of how we prepare our children for the future. Many of the experiments now underway remove parents from that discussion and reconvene in corporate boardrooms. This is not a good path for democracy to take, unquote. I urge you to amend these policies to increase board oversight of district educational programming. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, school board directors and superintendent Nyland. My name is Rosalind Shea, and I'm a parent of a student in Seattle Public Schools, as well as an employee of the district. I'm also a proud constituent of District 6. Under current policy, site and program placement and closure decisions don't come before the board for approval. Therefore, the board has no oversight of these decisions. Yet we, the public, expect the board to weigh in on them and we come to the board requesting oversight, sometimes screaming at them. On June 19, 2015, Middle College at High Point, a successful school that helps students most in need of support and a positive learning environment was closed. 
The Ida B. Wells School for Social Justice at the University of Washington was the next target, and it has been hollowed out and dismantled. Both of these schools provided a transformative education for our disenfranchised students. Had the board, particularly this current board, had oversight, I doubt that the closure of Middle College at High Point or the dismantling of the Ida B. Wells School would have occurred. Amending policy numbers F H01, F21, and 2200 will add greater school board oversight to program, site, and service placement and closure recommendation from staff or the superintendent. We need to grow our successful schools and celebrate the wonderful community building that occurs within their walls as well as the dedication of the teachers, staff, and most importantly, the students. They are not throwaways. Please vote yes to amend policy numbers H01, F21, and 2200. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Erin Okuno and I am the Executive Director of the Southeast Seattle Education Coalition. We are a coalition of over 70 CBOs, CBO um, schools and partners. I am here tonight to ask for your support for the opening of the Dearborn Park International S School Preschool. I would also like to briefly ask for your continued support of the Rainier Beach Inter um, High School International Baccalaureate Program and we are hopeful that we can find a way to continue funding this important program. I am yielding the rest of my time to my colleague, Imaija. Good day, my name is Imaija Smith. I am a parent at Dearborn Park Elementary School. I'm president of our PTA, and I'm uh, echoing Aaron's um, Senate comments as well as others to please vote yes for the Dearborn Park International School Preschool Program. Um, in addition to the school having a preschool program, there will, that space will also be utilized for after school care. And this past year, getting feedback from the school and families, that is like the leading um, issue that's needed at the school is an after school care that's due to lack of transportation that has been reduced from the district as well as the early start time next year. So our families are really um, depending on this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Frank Sorg, Jeffrey Clark, Brian Sedino. Hello, I'm Frank Swart, and I'd like to begin by quoting President Patu's remarks four years ago when she gave her conditional approval of the Bex 4 levy for ballot. I don't support turning our schools into 650 capacity. Our schools here in Seattle were built so that we could have neighborhood schools. This district voted on a neighborhood school plan. President Patu, I want to thank you for your comments because they indicate your heart is in the right place and I believe the board is ready to support you. So amazingly, we are sitting here right now with a plan for a 660 school at Loyal Heights, which could easily uh, enroll 825 with all the extra flex classrooms. Currently, the enrollment in the current boundary is 425 and shrinking. So the issue is, can a mega school at Loyal Heights ever be considered a neighborhood school? Well, let's start with at opening in two years. You can tell from the gerrymandered boundary here that it uh, has to stretch quite a bit to even just get the 640 kids you'd need at opening. And that would be uh, moving kids up to 1.8 miles to their local school uh, past three other closer schools. Uh, let's talk in the near five-year term. The school district's website has shown, uh, is predicting that there will be enrollment shrinkage in this boundary and also in this extended boundary by 25 and by 50 over the next five years. Finally, there is a long-term plan. Seattle has a comprehensive plan and it calls for most of the growth to be off this map to the south in downtown Ballard with very little growth in Loyal Heights. Finally, the real clincher is that staff has admitted that they did not consider this school right here, Whittier Elementary, being opened two years after the remodel here. So now you've got 660 capacity here, you've got 450, that's 1110. That is just too much. So full steam ahead, because we can't afford to stop? I don't think so, I think au contraire. 
we need to stop because there's $44 million building a school that we cannot fill up without busing kids there. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, school board members, uh, Superintendent Nylands. My name is Jeff Clark, and I am um, a very proud citizen of the city of Seattle, a city that supports things like the Families and Education Levy. I'm a very proud parent of Seattle Public Schools, and I'm thrilled to have seen my sons go through Concord, Denny, and now on to Chief Self. I'm extremely proud to be a principal in our district for the last 16 years the last 11 at my dream job, being the principal of Denny International Middle School. And I'm also really proud to be an employee of Seattle Public Schools, a district that puts equity and gap closure not just on strategic plans, not just on the wall in fancy letters, but into policy, into policies like ensuring educational and racial equity, policy number 0030. I'm proud to be part of a district that has a racial equity analysis tool that we developed and is board approved to guide us all in the work that we do. I'm also here today to tell you that I'm concerned. And I'm concerned because I do not see a unified focus on equity and gap elimination. And I say elimination. We don't have time for closure. It's time to eliminate the achievement gap. I do not see a unified focus on that amongst our board amongst our central office staff, amongst our principal corps, amongst our teachers, amongst our community. I do not see policy number 0030 guiding us as we support one strategic plan to accomplish that goal. I do not see us using the board approved racial equity analysis tool to guide us in all of the decisions we make, small and large. I'd like to close by saying, in order to deliver on our strategic plan, we must focus on equity now. In order to eliminate the gap, we must focus on equity now. In order to give our children what they need and they deserve, we must focus on equity now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> hi, my name is Brian. I'm a current University of Washington senior, graduating senior in uh, the School of Public Health, and I'm here to talk about minority youth's uh, high school dropout rates. To piggyback of what he was saying, um, I wouldn't be here today had it not been th because of Proyecto Severus program. And I do not need to tell you that seven out of 20 black students and nine out, of tw nine out of 20 Latino students do not graduate from high school. That's the people that I'm advocating for here today. Regarding crime, if we nationwide, if we were to increase uh, male graduation rate by 5%, um, we would see a savings of $4.9 billion crime-related cost. Relating to health and life expectancy, a study in 2008 found that African-American males with education levels higher than college, than a college degree, live about 9.7 years more than African-American males without a college degree. The numbers are there, and I'm pretty sure you all know that. Uh, like I said, I'm here to, have, there's many things that I could talk about today. And I have a policy brief for you all that I would give, that I would give at the end of the, uh, me talking, but um, where I highlight the benefits of increasing the funding and resources to Proyecto Saber and its teachers, um, just to name a few, reading scores in Proyecto, for Proyecto students were 11% higher from previous years uh, to Latino students. You know, a good way to think about this would be through a community-based approach where we, involve, where we involve everybody, the community, where we involve every stakeholder, Proyecto teachers, regular teachers, uh, parents, high school students, administrators, uh, probation officers, academic counselors, the whole community, even the uh, Seattle Schools District Equity and Race Relations Department, and have them be the key drive in, in this movement. Finally, like I said, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't because of the Proyecto program. So uh, please take a look at this policy brief, not now because I know you're all busy, but later on when you're at home with, with patients, because I worked really hard on this as my graduation project. So please take a look at that and thank you. Thank you. John Ellison, Marianne Ferbo, Jim Bristow. Good evening, thank you for listening. 
My name is John Ellison. I'm a close neighbor to the Loyal Heights Elementary as, if, as, as my family and I live half a block south on 26th Avenue. I'm also a father to a three-year-old who potentially attend Loyal Heights. The Loyal Heights remodel design is way too big for the lot and much too big for the neighborhood's needs. It destroys the vitality of the school and the neighborhood. To be frank, I'm appalled by the lack of outdoor space being proposed. The design does not balance the vital need for outdoor space that the school children and the neighborhood require. The 30% reduction in play space combined with an enrollment increase to 660 students means too many kids in too small a space. This leaves roughly 64 square feet per child, drastically smaller than Daniel Bagley at 160 square feet, Salmon Bay at 303 square feet, and North Beach at 420 square feet per child. Where will the children safely play? Will this crowding mean parents won't hang out before and after school to let their children play while invaluable networking and community building take place? Furthermore, there are numerous studies that speak to the impacts of physical exercise on better learning and cognition. To drastically reduce the outdoor play space flies in the face of this research. The school will be too big for the neighborhood's needs. Demogra demo <coughs> demographic forecasts indicate declining enrollment at Loyal Heights. To meet the school's capacity, the proposed boundary map can only be described as gerrymandered. A school this big is a waste of precious money. What about capacity at Webster? What about the capacity that Webster could contribute? Won't there be additional capacity when North Beach gets remodeled? Dear board members, please, we expect and demand better of the Seattle Public Schools. Please don't make this mistake. The burden of that mistake falls on the children and the neighborhood, a burden that will last decades. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mary Ann Furpo. I am from the Loyal Heights neighborhood. I've been a Loyal Heights rev a resident for 25 years. I'm here again to urge you to help us. Um, as you've heard from previous testimony, the school proposed the proposed plan is too big for the site and it doesn't make any sense to put the same size school regardless of the lot size. I recently read something um, on from school uh, from the district's site that talked a little bit about how the four classroom model specification and the three classroom model specification should not be used to um, that they should not be used to just push a project through. You need to consider the appropriateness of those plans for the site. I got here a little bit late today, but I understand that, I, that there was already an announcement that nothing was gonna change at Loyal Heights. Um, I'm just gonna urge you again that Something needs to change at Loyal Heights. Um, I want to tell you about what happened at Loyal Heights today, where the principal took a sign-up sheet and tried to get parents on the playground to sign in support of this remodel. And it didn't happen. The neighborhood, the parents, the PTA even, has been very clear and strong in their opposition to this size plan not a modernization and remodel of Loyal Heights, and a modest expansion of Loyal Heights. Everybody wants that, just not this plan. This is not the right plan for this neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jim Bristow. I'm going to give my time to Steve Nesich, who is on the design committee for Loyal Heights. So. Hi, I want to, uh, I appreciate this opportunity to address the uh, board members and the superintendent, and I want to acknowledge my fellow Loyal Heights resident for allowing me to do that. I'm Steve Nessage. I was the legislative chair of the uh, Loyal Heights PTA last year. My son finished six terrific years at this wonderful school, and I have a very deep and sincere emotional commitment to Loyal Heights Elementary, and I'll always think of it as our school. Um, I've communicated with, with some of you about this before. 
Um, but I was also on the building design committee. I'm officially still on the building design committee and received a communication from Stephen Moore in the school district today to his credit. Uh, while I hold absolutely no personal antipathy towards anyone uh, within the Seattle Public Schools who has been charged with uh, overseeing this project or the firm that they hire to carry these plans out, I am absolutely so strongly opposed to the current plans for two reasons. One, the sheer size of this uh, expansion is so out of scale with this neighborhood. You are taking a community school that is in many ways a model for what we want all Seattle public elementary schools to be, and you're turning it from a community school that works so well into an urban education compound that is essentially giving our children and our families the message that we do not want our kids to be at recess. We do not want our kids to be physically active. We do not want a balance between the focus within the classroom, the academic diligence, and the thing that all children need, the, the space to be free and to run and to experience the fun of physical activity. The other reason that I am against this is that we have been so neglected in this process. We have essentially seen a school, uh, a, a school bureaucracy. Your remark. Essentially, they've been treating us in a perfunctory way, in a way where we're basically, you know, they have to rubber stamp the fact that they had these meetings. Please conclude your remark. At no point were we, were we consulted, we the community, on what we want and what would be appropriate. Please alter this project. Not stop it, but alter it considerably to reflect the values of this community of parents and residents. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Richard Warner, Justin Adam Com, Laura Kramer. Uh, my name is Richard Werner. I am a resident of Seattle, right across the street from Royal Heights Elementary, and my wife and I have lived there since 1984. So we're old folks in the neighborhood. Uh, we support improvements to the Royal Heights Elementary School, but we do not support the size of the proposed uh, remodel. It's far too large for the size of the property. And uh, I think most of the people involved in they know it, because we had hearings where that was called the Departures Advisory Committee, which I, I guess is euphemistically is used to say, we are violating city zoning rules and we want permission to do it. And, and one of these things was that they couldn't have setbacks because the school had to come up to the edge of the sidewalk. And after apparently some complaining and other impacts, they were able to make changes. And we discovered that there was a parking study done that said there would be no impact on parking or traffic in the area by doubling the number of people at the school. And pure logic would say, it doesn't matter what the numbers say, that doesn't make sense and it doesn't work. Um, you know, we've also heard about the play area being cut back considerably in size. And that I think that's really wrong and it's used a lot by our neighborhood and by a lot of the kids and the parents and I think that's a real loss. And one of the other things that my wife pointed out, she was wondering if there's a potential of 800 to 900 people in this school building. If there's an evacuation, where are you gonna put all of them safely to keep track of them if there is an evacuation? Uh, there are apparently many school plans available and I would really encourage you to reevaluate this. I ask that you instruct the people responsible for this project to go back to the drawing board and come up with a reasonable plan for a school that is suitable, suitable for the size of the property. We heard that there might be extra expense, expense if the plan was revisited, but I think it would be better to spend the money now and create a project that everybody can be proud of and re rather than being an example of poor planning and misuse of taxpayer money. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Justin Calm, ORCA K through 8's PTSA Legislative Chair. Our school's enrollment has been falling, so the district has cut our budget. 
All our mitigation requests have been denied. Assistant Superintendent Tolley told us that if after open enrollment, it turns out we have higher enrollment than projected, we might get some of our budget restored. This makes sense as long as you look at things for, with a very limited perspective. The problem with this perspective is that it pretends that the budget process itself has no effect on enrollment. In truth, it has had a devastating effect at ORCA. The school's precarious budget situation has caused an exodus of staff and students. Our assistant principal, fed up with the yearly question of whether her position at ORCA will be funded, has accepted a position at another school, and she's just one of many staff who have or will leave. As their beloved teachers have left, students have left the school too. At a recent PTSA meeting, I learned that none of our fifth grade families plan to return next year. I don't blame them. For them to have stayed, the district would have had to have made it clear that it saw ORCA as a good long-term investment. Instead, the district decided to take a wait and see approach. This dire uncertainty has created a fight or flight response in the ORCA community. Those of us who remain are ready to fight. We are having an all school meeting with Kelly Aramaki on June 8th, and I'm here to give you a preview of what to expect if that meeting doesn't go well. We're ready to stage a walkout and a demonstration here at the Stanford Center. We're not asking for special treatment. Our library gets no funding for books, our middle school grades have no foreign language classes, our younger grades get no music education, our pleas to be included in the district creative advantage program have been denied, but we're not asking for those things right now. We're just asking to get a full-time counselor, a full-time assistant principal, a full-time librarian, and a half-time teacher for, it, for enrichment classes. If the district can't provide these basics, how can it possibly expect ORCA to survive? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Laura Gramer, and I'm assuming my class is Daphne Speaks Dyer. Hi, I'm Daphne Steyer, and I am speaking today on behalf of hard of hearing students. Um, and that education is quite different than what these parents will be talking about. But um, hard of hearing students um, are very technology dependent. And so if you can imagine sitting in this room today and uh, hearing through your earbuds, let's say, that you aren't able to take out conversations in other rooms or a football game or something like that. With the outdated technology that we've had, um, that's what kids have to listen to is not the football game, but the conversations that are happening in the lobby and so on. And I've been talking about this issue for four years and I'm at the tail end of this, but this is outdated technology. Likewise, last year I had um, two months where my daughter was sitting in a classroom where she, the FM was working but the pass around mic didn't exist. So she could hear, you can again imagine, you could hear um, people that are a couple feet away from you, but not farther away. And so we have a good audiologist now, and I can, um, even when she does put in a request, so that's a few weeks, so, and I know the budget issues are complicated, but we're talking about IEP violations. Our kids need to hear every day. So thank you. Thank you. Hello. I'm here today but I have concerns about the DSA program. The DSA program is a piece of history and that language in way. It's the first year of the so called change. But what I feel like we're taking it back to step one. At this point, our DSA program. Okay. Better. Okay. At this point, the DSA program is basically starting over with a new teacher. I do not have my son to perhaps to go to kindergarten at TAPS for several reasons. There's a lack of language peers and critical math. There's over 600 deaf and hard of hearing students, some who are lost in the system with the Seattle Public Schools. Where are they? The current speech therapist at TAP is deficient with the ASL English bilingual approach and does not support the language acquisition task that we've chosen for our children. And she's not deaf friendly. We do not want to work with her because her bias 
and lack of understanding about their culture needs to be taken in consideration when we make goals and recommendations. Instead, we need more space, language pathologists, and educational audiologists who work with the whole child and not just the ear. A new teacher and program starts moving in the fall, building on top of what? I want to let him be used as a guinea pig again, like in his first year with the disaster. Then I encourage you to invest in your program that you have an infrastructure that has value. If you keep hiring teachers and hoping that they'll make it work and not invest, and stressing out the program, we lose the every as soon as the teacher leaves. Please conclude your remark. And we still do have a foundation to show. Um, okay. Last three, my last point. Partnering with Wilson is a great step to build with the preschool program. The people of Wilson get it and have a qualified team and infrastructure in place. After learning that Please the conclude your remarks. Extended for only one more year. Okay. I like to. Thank you. Miranda Russler, Molly Sano, and Wendy Cruz. All right, as you may recall from my previous testimony, I'm a school psychologist and have a depth of professional understanding related to special education. Our oldest daughter, Lyndon, is three and deaf. So far, she's been denied anything but surface level listening supports. This is grossly negligent and denies her full access to communication and language. She's being required to conform to a hearing system and shoulder the entire burden of communication, access, and social engagement. Lyndon deserves full access to the classroom. Amplification alone is not enough. She needs ASL. She has a right to access the complete learning environment so that she can meet her full potential and not just catch bits and pieces. Just making it through is not good enough. Lyndon is surrounded by hearing family members. She's the only one who's deaf. She's made statements such as, sisters don't have hearing aids. And she said to a deaf visitor, you have ears like mine. Will she develop a positive self-image and love this aspect of herself? How can she learn to value her deafness if she's segregated from others with similar communication needs? DHH students should not need to fall behind and struggle before appropriate tools are provided. Providing language early in development is much more appropriate and effective than attempting to teach language later. At that point, grade level instruction will stop while language is acquired. The way that students are being found eligible for ASL programs is seriously flawed. Students that do not demonstrate delays are being excluded. Being deaf or hard of hearing does not mean that you cannot also be developing typically or even be advanced. But being a high achiever does not negate the fact that DHH students are not hearing children. Please assemble proper evaluation teams. Get knowledgeable and experienced personnel to the table and have teams value the input and listen to those professionals. Comprehensively support each child, including social emotional well-being. Many DHH students need to have access to peers with similar communication needs. This means bringing large groups of DHH children together to access high quality education that is meeting state standards. We're prescriptively confined to assimilating our deaf child to a hearing world. DHH children need a school where they can access instruction in ASL with cla a classroom of same grade peers. Thank you. Good evening, board. My name is Molly Sano. My son is profoundly deaf, also profoundly cute. When he lived in an orphanage in China, he wasn't given access to language. Instead of visual communication, he was expected to understand and use speech. But you know, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. When we met him, he could only express joy and anger through smiling or screaming. But within three months of becoming fully immersed in American Sign Language, his language was completely caught up to age level. Now, having just turned four, he can express complex, abstract thoughts and emotions in the language that's most natural to his brain. 
Now he can tell me exactly how disappointed he was when his sister stole the last cookie. <laughs> This year, he's absolutely thrived at Rosen Preschool. He's surrounded by same-aged peers, strong teachers who are all using the same language. This isn't a radical concept for hearing students, but for deaf students in the city of Seattle, it's a luxury. Unless Seattle drastically changes its deaf and hard of hearing program, preschool is tragically gonna be the last time he has full access to education and peers who use his language. There are approximately 600 deaf and hard of hearing students in our district, very few of whom have full access to their education and social environment. If Seattle built a strong magnet program, all of them could be in classrooms that meet their communication and social emotional needs, all of them, likely at a lower cost to the district than the current services being provided. These students need critical mass to thrive. Seattle can breed the future generation of deaf doctors, lawyers, and engineers, but to be able to do that, all DHH students must first be able to access their basic right to communication. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wendy Cruz. Good evening. Um, my son, along with um, many of the other parents here, um, I have a child, he's four years old, and he's also deaf. Um, he attends the Rosen Preschool, and, um, sorry, I just, okay, and sorry, I just threw together my, my testimony. Um, as many of the other parents in this room with deaf and hard of hearing children, I'm here to address the lack of quality deaf education in the Seattle School District. The fact that my son is not going to have or receive the same education as his hearing counterparts is a violation of his rights as an American. I encourage you to continue to develop the program that is being pieced together at TOPS. I recently toured the space. Um, the rooms are down in a lower level. It's something similar to a basement. There are no windows. Um, there are no technological assistive devices like smart screens, which are standard in other deaf education programs in other cities and in other states. The kindergartners share a classroom with fifth graders I mean, the current program is, it's completely subpar. What, what they've presented to us is what they're building. And I feel like our children are guinea pigs being tossed into this unknown program that's being thrown together at the 11th hour. Um, many of us parents are facing the reality of having to fight with the school district to send our kids to other districts, um, other cities. Many of us are being forced to move away just to get a quality education for our children, but we shouldn't have to do that. We should be able to stay here, send our children to a local school with a quality, rich ASL program, um, quality deaf education, just like all the other children. So I'm asking you all to take a look into what's happening with the deaf and hard of hearing program and um, take a look at the program that's being built. I'm sure that you won't be satisfied as, as the rest of us aren't. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our last speaker, Anthony Salazar. No, Anthony Salazar here. Okay, Daphna Steiner. Oh, okay. Donna Alexander. Alicia Egger. Camille Peterson. Chandra Benita. Celeste Gilman. Uh, let's see, can we? I'm sorry, I, can I lower the mic a little? Hello, uh, I'm Celeste Gilman, this is my daughter, Paola Garrison, and she is a hopeful uh, second generation early applicant to kindergarten. We both have the misfortune of being born just barely too late. Paella, you wanna tell them about uh, a kindergarten practice? Yes. <laughs> I love doing it. Yeah. 
what, what, you had fun? <laughs> and what, what did you like? I just love that it was fun. <laughs> She's very excited about entering kindergarten. We have not been excited a, at all about the process of figuring out how to make this happen for her. Uh, there has been very little information provided. It's been at the last minute. We've had maybe one or two people who have been uh, friendly and everyone else has been very, unfortunately, very hostile. It's been a very uh, burdensome process. And we have, uh, we're, you know, have the privilege to, to try and go through that process, but we have yet another step now uh, after the application and the testing. Uh, we now have to also submit an appeal uh, with very little time provided for any of this, with just the arbitrariness of when she happened to be born. Don't think that this is a process that serves families or kids well. And we hope that we can navigate through it. And she's very excited to start kindergarten next year at Kimball. And that we hope that that's what will happen. And hope that other, that this, this process can be revisited so that it's a better process for other families and families who may not have uh, as the resources that we have to figure out how to get the best education for their children. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. That is the end of our public testimony. And we now come to the board comment section of our agenda. Director Burke. Thank you. Um, I would like to, uh, to thank Cornelius, our, our student guest on the board. Um, unfortunately, he had to leave a little bit early, but it was a pleasure serving with him in a short time. Uh, I also want to acknowledge my gratitude for our amazing staff um, that were um, received awards and commendations earlier today. It makes me proud to um, serve on a board with high quality staff and leaders um, that are demonstrating their achievement, their leadership, and their innovation. It's a role model for all of us. Uh, I really appreciated the, uh, the, our musical guests this evening, the Cleveland High School Sym Symphonic Orchestra. I learned something. I learned that Larry Nyland played violin. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was gonna also let folks know, anybody who's in the audience or watching on TV, that if you're thinking of quitting, don't, because I quit after middle school and I regret it as well. Um, maybe we should get together and do a duet sometimes. It would be terrible. <laughs> um, I want to congratulate the 299 plus, 299 and growing students with the state seal of biliteracy. Um, that's a, you know, it's, it's a great um, honor for Seattle to be able to put that feather in their cap as, as uh, our students are um, demonstrating their multilingual strength and we're showing the value of that as well. Um, I wanted to give a quick thanks um, to Carmen Rahm, who also isn't here to hear it, but um, I learned a lot from him around some of the technology pieces that the district has in place, and I really appreciated some of his, uh, his comments that he shared with me, the candor, um, and he didn't always say politically correct things, but he was a really interesting person, and I think he brought a lot to the district. He, he absolutely will be missed. Um, I, I had a couple of great educational experiences in the last couple of weeks. I um, had the pleasure of visiting Center School, and I want to thank um, Principal Brutsova for that. Um, her enthusiasm and dedication was, was contagious. They have about 250 students tucked away in a funky little place that uh, for us old Seattleites is in the center house and for folks that are more contemporary know it as the armory. Um, really neat little program and um, I got to see the arts. You know, they've got a really great arts focus. I got to go upstairs and observe their humanities classes and the rigor that was in that where they were actually, they were, they were definitely teaching at a level which I would say is beyond Common Core standards. And then I had the pleasure of also um, passing through an AP Biology course 
where um, I know when I was going to school, I never got to dissect a fetal pig, and that was pretty cool. Um, I also was honored to be uh, a science fair judge at the Louisa Boren K-8 Science Fair. Um, and I thank uh, Principal Ben Ostrom and teacher Craig Parsley. Um, there was a great write-up in GeekWire around that. A couple of, s some of the students' projects, um, the Mars lander, forward deployed, parabolic, something or other. It was pretty impressive. Fertilizer, uh, homemade fertilizer using urine and fireplace ash. So some of these projects that the kids are coming up with are super impressive. So I wish them and all of Seattle Public students a fun and rewarding experience at the Middle School Science Fair, which is taking place tomorrow at the Museum of Flight. And I recommend anybody who's interested in science um, goes and attend that. From my email and community meetings, a couple of trending issues that I wanted to share some comments on. The 24 re credit requirement and revised high school schedule. I'm hearing a lot of thoughts, concerns around that. Um, significant challenges of the three by five schedule for AP and IB classes. This is a situation where we have um, a lot of unintended consequences that we have to figure out and manage. So please keep your comments coming. Um, the more clarity that you can provide on what works well and what doesn't work well for specific high school plans, the better able we are to make decisions. Uh, we're also um, making forward progress on Lincoln High School. Uh, I, I walked the site today and we'll be meeting with the school design advisory team later this week uh, to learn more about how the building plans are shaping up and the academic programs that um, will be housed within. Following up some public testimony comments, I would like to ask our enrollment services to reach out to a couple of our um, people at public testimony, our student guest and the, uh, the last speaker. Um, whenever I hear the word hostile um, used in conjunction with our customer service, it, it gives me pause and I want to make sure that we're putting our best foot forward and um, really being open and, and inviting to our families because they truly are what makes our district. Uh, comment on the resolution 2015-16-15 on alternate assessments. Um, there was a numerical error on one of the uh, statistics regarding uh, ethnic breakdown. That has been corrected and the revised resolution is going to be reposted. And uh, I, I want to thank my colleague for pointing that out. And then I appreciate the, the comments from the, the Loyal Heights community and the Deaf of Hearing, Heart of Hearing community as well that helps us um, better make our, our decisions when we're looking at funding, when we're looking at how to manage capacity. Um, these have been ongoing issues and the fact that folks continue to raise them tells me that we're not there yet. So thank you for your feedback. Dr. Uh, Geary? Really appreciate the strong showing from Cleveland High School today. And I guess what I heard um, from the musical performance, from the symphonic performance, which really warmed me was that I think there was only one senior in that whole group of kids, so that they will return and be part of the 40 that of that growing program and how exciting in a city known for its strong music programs that we have yet another one that is, is coming up and growing. So that is, that's wonderful. Um, to President, ASB President Cornelius, our guest, I'm glad to see him here as well, our first speaker. And you know, no surprise that they won the STEM Lighthouse. And so congratulations as well to uh, Principal George Breland. Also wonderful to hear all the awards that our staff is winning. Um, as I work with many of you and see you throughout the community, I, I too am very honored to work with you and see your enthusiasm and the hard work that's going into what we're trying to accomplish in the education of our students. A couple 
points to that end. I appreciate uh, the special education staff and Kim Whitworth coming out to Laurelhurst Elementary to work with the parents. That is a school that has, um, is under a lot of pressure right now in almost every realm. All of the different problems that you hear throughout the district, be it capacity, be it test scores, be it um, many different programs, be it uh, playground coverage, all of these things are coming to head in one small school, and I appreciate Seattle Public Schools continuing to come out, talk with the parents there, try to find a path that will allow that community to mend maybe some hard feelings and come together and move forward for um, the betterment of the children, because I know that is what is at everybody's heart. I did my monthly meeting at the Brettler House. I did it at sort of a different uh, location. Um, and that is in the Sandpoint uh, Magnuson Park. And that is what uh, Superintendent Nyland was talking about, a community that is growing, uh, many housing projects going in there, the UW housing, a lot of pressure there. And so I thank PTA President Chandra Hampson for arranging an opportunity for me to have a community meeting right within that area. And I hope to have more of those opportunities. And I think it goes back to the ideas that we as a board of trying to break out of sort of the typical paths that we've been on in order to make ourselves more accessible. And so to that extent, to, if there are other communities within my district that would like for me to come and have my meeting that makes it more convenient for those families, please reach out to me. I'm happy to do that. I attended a workshop put on by the Roadmap Project to discuss the new federal change, the SSA. Um, and a couple interesting things. Happy to see uh, among several of our employees, Pat Sanders, and Gail Morris there, uh, awesome to have them there uh, learning about these changes in law. I guess one of the things that was most interesting to me uh, in attending that is that our regional partners are not in step with us and not in line with us in terms of how we view um, the assessments and the burdensome of assessments and that they see that Seattle Public Schools may be moving in a way that jeopardizes the funding for our state as a whole in terms of the opt-out rate. And I think it's important that we are sensitive to that and that we are all reaching out to discuss what this issue means to all the different groups within our region so that we can act in a way that is consistent. Because if we are going to re-examine assessments, um, and we're going to be sincere about moving towards the legislature and talking with Olympia, we also need to be sure that we are listening to the concerns in our region and throughout our state with regard to assessments so that we come out with an assessment that's going to be meaningful to everybody, that will address issues of equity, provide us meaningful feedback in a timely manner. So I just wanted to let people know that I, I did hear that and I'm sensitive to that. I attended today um, a gala luncheon for a group called Financial Beginnings, and they emphasize and provide financial literacy for free. Um, and they indicated that this is something that is really a great thing to tap into at this time of year when maybe curriculum or sort of the kids are losing interest in some of the things. And, and it, they say that this is where they get a lot of calls to come in and do a financial literacy course within the schools at all different levels. So um, I, I just raised that as an option out there that is a growing group. It sounded very exciting. And um, as the keynote speaker, Aaron Jones, said, we can do a lot to prepare our kids for college, and we can get them college ready. But if they don't understand how to pay for that college, if they don't understand student loans, if they don't understand how money and grants and scholarships are all going to play together, they may get to the door and not be able to make that next step. So I thought that was a really neat program that we need to look at um, tapping into, especially because at this point, free of cost is you know music to all of our ears. Going to uh, seeing Directors Harris and Directors Burke at the Washington Paramount Duty launch. Happy to stand up for them. Happy to thank them for the work that they are doing to bring awareness to the funding issues in our state. And so we all need to continue to raise our voice up to Olympia to let them know all the struggles that we are seeing. We want to do so much for our district. And we are, again, meeting time and time again the limitations of finances and where to put them. 
And then finally, um, I also want to make a note to Carmen Rahm, um, thank him in, in absentia for all that he has done. And I guess not only the technolo technology piece, but just the infectious enthusiasm and positive energy that he brought to his job every day. I think it was just a pleasure to be in the room with him. And, and that was just, I will miss that very much, but I wish him well in Kent where he now has a two minute commute rather than a 42 minute commute. My next meeting is gonna be different. Um, it turns out we have a Wednesday afternoon with no board meetings. And so I'm gonna take that as an opportunity to sort of switch up my community meeting time <laughs> up in Northeast Seattle. So that will be June, Wednesday, June 22nd from four to 6 p.m. at the Northeast Branch Library. Thank you. Dr. Patrick. Thank you. I'd just like to begin my remarks by thanking all of the um, people who came and provided testimony today, particularly those who um, brought their children along with them. It was a wonderful experience to see kids here, a bunch of kiddos. They make sure that um, we know up on the dais how important the work that we do is and ultimately who the end users of it are. So thank you for that. Um, I also want to thank uh, and appreciate the students who were here earlier. I don't think any of them stayed, but who earned the seal of uh, biliteracy. Uh, I know that's a lot of hard work, and I know that because my I aspire to have my daughter, who's a seventh grader, actually um, earn that same award sometime in the not too distant future. So I appreciate all the hard work that they put in to receive that seal of biliteracy. Um, Shanna, Shanna Brown um, and her impressive work along with Gail Morris on the Since Time Immemorial uh, curriculum is critically important as we uh, try to address our issues of equity. And Bernardo Ruiz also receiving awards lets us know that uh, we are moving fast. I don't, I don't think there's anyone who would say we're moving fast enough, but uh, we appreciate the fact that he and his team are providing leadership um, to Aaron Okuno, um, community partner of long standing, who received the award from the Washington State School Administrators. Um, congratulations on your leadership. And uh, it's a, an award well earned. And to Cassandra Johnson, um, who I don't see, uh, I don't see her, yeah, but um, w when I heard about the work that she's doing and the fact that she was able to enlist lots of various folks to make sure that we provide meals to our families uh, on Saturdays and Sundays. I know that that is critical, critically important work and that her serving as a catalyst is awe-inspiring. Um, equally awe-inspiring was the Cleveland Symphonic or Orchestra. It's wonderful to hear how well they're doing and how they're anticipating great things in the future. And then finally, um, I will end with my community meetings. I have one scheduled for the 18th of June and uh, one also scheduled on the 16th of July and both of those are at the Douglas Truth Library at 23rd and Yesler in the Central District. They start at 10 and go until 11.30. Dr. Peters. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to uh, recognize the members of the deaf and hard of hearing community who came out in force tonight reminding us that we still have work to do on the program and services that we offer their children. And um, the question I have tonight is for staff that could be answered in a Friday memo, and that is, um, have we looked at other districts to see what they offer, and is there something that we can learn? Because when I hear families talk about leaving our district to find better services for their children, that troubles me. So I'm sure the answer is yes, but I would like to know more about that. So if, if someone could provide that information to us in a Friday memo that we could also provide to the community, I think that would be very helpful. Because surely there's something that we can learn um, so we can improve what we're doing. I'm also troubled to hear that we may have some technical problems with some of the, the apparatus that our children need and that not all of our children are getting the ASL. Um, instruction that they need. And so I would like to know more about what it would take to provide more for the, these children. I mean, we have said before that if we, if we provide for specific groups what they need, 
that can benefit all of our children if we do it right, if we have the right approach. Um, let's see. On the issue of Loyal Heights, I, uh, it was my understanding that there might be some possibility to do some kind of adjustment to the playground space. And if so, I very much would support that because it seems to me that that's one of the crucial issues here is the families very much want to be sure that the children have the space outdoors um, to be kids and that this project does not overwhelm the space that it is on. I will say though that we are, <laughs> thank you, we are in a, tr a difficult situation as a district because we, we're growing at a rate of about a thousand students a year. We're one of the fastest growing cities in, in the nation. And here we are as a district trying to respond to that. And I, when I first got involved in public education advocacy, it was because the Seattle School District was trying to close my child's school and other schools back in 2008. And those of us in the parent communities were desperately trying to tell the district not to do that. We said, you know, enrollment is growing. We see people with babies, don't do this. And so here's the district trying to do the right thing, and that is provide enough space, and yet it's being chided for maybe going too far in making decisions that are going to create very large schools. So the question is, how do we find the right balance for that? And so I would like to know more about what it means to have a school that can, has a capacity for 600. Does that necessarily mean we put 600 kids in there? And some parents said tonight that there actually could be as many as 800 in there. I have not heard that before, so I would like some clarity on that. Because I certainly don't think any of us support completely uh, packing a school to the gills. But there might be a benefit to having some extra space, especially now that we have a K-3 smaller class size mandate, which is in everyone's interest to, to meet. So I would like to know a little bit more about, about that. And that could be, again, a question for staff. And also, you know, when, we, when the district uses portables. Nobody's happy with that either. So we have to find some kind of balance where we provide enough proper space for our students without taking out the playground space and um, without creating structures that are beyond, beyond the proportion. I will say though, as somebody who frequently goes to Ballard, I do see an awful lot of development. And the zoning there does allow uh, for a lot of um, condensed development. So I, I don't know if it's wise to err on the side uh, that we're not expecting a lot of families in that area. So if we have to have buildings that are not completely full, that's probably better than not having enough buildings. But again, I'm gonna ask for staff for some clarity on some of the questions that are brought up tonight. And just want you all to know that I definitely hear your concerns. <laughs> a couple other issues. Um, Something that's been on my radar from the community concerns high school graduation requirements and how they differ from school to school. And that is something that I'm not able to offer a clear explanation of. And again, I'm going to ask staff, that might be Michael Tully, I'm not sure, to explain why that is. Um, a specific example that has come up is the requirement that students take a health class and how they take it, whether they can take it online and which online providers are, are considered acceptable and which ones are not. Apparently there's not uniformity throughout our district and I've been asked why is that. So if you could shed some light on that in the Friday memo, that would be, that would be fantastic. Um, I'm concerned about testimony that talks about some of our alternative schools that seem to not be getting the resources they need. Specifically tonight we had somebody from Orca K-8, we've had families from center school tell us that they're losing their, their art teacher. And I'm worried about the trend of not supporting our alternative schools. And then when we don't provide the resources, then the enrollment goes down and then it becomes this spiral. Enrollment goes down, the school doesn't have enough money, it's not enough resources. I think we have to establish a commitment as a district to our alternative schools and do everything we can to show this commitment so enrollment won't go down and so the schools are not depleted and so they have the resources that, that they, they need to offer what the parents are looking for when they choose a school such as these. So I just want to keep that on, on everyone's radar 
and to say that you know I I believe we have a lot of support on this board for alternative education in various forms because as we often say our children are not all the same they need different they need different approaches different services different philosophies and we as a district should be committed to approaching you know their needs any way we can uh, two more items. Um, I had the opportunity to read the Nutrition Services Report the other day. And it was very interesting because a lot of the recommendations that came out of that mirror what has been brought to the board in the last year or so from the lunch and recess families, from the UW report, um, specifically having to do with how much time our children need to eat the recommendation that they have recess before lunch. And so um, the use of local kitchens instead of central kitchen was even mentioned. So I'm very interested to see what our response is going to be as a district to these recommendations because a lot of the recommendations resonated with what we've been hearing from the community, from what some of us know as parents who have been to the schools and watching our kids rushing through lunch, not really having a whole lot of time and so um, it's, it's a not a short report, but it's, it's an interesting read. I, I recommend it. And I think finally I want to just um, update on my latest. My next community meeting will be Saturday, June 11th, from 11 to 12.45 at the Queen Anne Library. Thank you. I would also like to recognize uh, the Cleveland Symphonic Orchestra for their amazing performance. Um, I, I act also tried to play the violin many years ago, but <laughs> didn't, <laughs> didn't do too well, so I would change the piano, but <laughs> I also wanted to say thank you to each uh, uh, person who actually took time to come and let us know about your issues. Uh, um, we may not resolve your issue on a timely manner, but I would like to say that we hear you loud and clear, and we will do what we can to resolve some of the issues that are ongoing that you have come up and uh, br brought to our attention. Hi. I also would like to say thank you to our Cornelius from Cleveland for being a, a part of our board today. Uh, it's always great to have a student um, be a part of our board and be able to uh, comment on what's in their heart and what they're doing that's exciting within their own schools and what direction they're going. We'd also like to congratulate all the students and staff who received recognition tonight for a job well done. Um, we can never say enough, thank you enough to staff that gives their above and beyond uh, for our kids in each our individual schools. And also, um, I would like to also congratulate Cleveland for their STEM Lighthouse Award. Um, job well done and also the 299 students of the seal by literacy for their success um, i i realize how important that is because um, i too when i came here i learned how to i didn't speak any english but learned how to speak english and be able to write and speak my own language so i could be able to understand continue to understand uh, my language and being able to write and read is, is amazing and I think it's amazing that we're actually encouraging our kids to do that within uh, our schools. So congratulations for, to all the students that actually that were here tonight. Uh, and I actually would really like to see us, uh, you know, I'm, I'm also kind of uh, a little concerned about our parents uh, coming in and talking about the deaf and hearing program. You know, um, what are we doing and what direction are we going in terms of actually resolving some of these problems? Um, when we, we hear about kids not getting the kind of services they need, these are kids who are in need and I think that, you know, we as a district should really look into these programs to provide the most ultimate opportunity for these children so they can get the best care that they can so hopefully we can actually be able to see what's going on with the deaf and hearing program and hopefully that we can actually be able to look at it and see what we need to do to move it up and make sure that we provide ample opportunities for all our kids that are in this program. Uh, for ORCA, 
we hear you loud and clear, and I think it's really uh, sad that we cannot fully fund our programs in order for our children to get the best education that they can in our school to really move forward. It's, it's sad for us to see uh, not being able to fund a lot of the various programs in our schools. And that's something that we're hoping that we can really work at and be able to look at what we need to do to really uh, utilize fundings to be able to, so we can be able to fund a lot of the programs that are ongoing in our schools and be able to see our schools thriving instead of going downhill. So we hear you loud and clear and we're hoping that we can come together as a board and also staff and looking at what can we do to be able to provide those opportunities for all our kids. And my uh, community meeting will be on June 25th at Cafe Vita from 10 to 11.30. Um, it's on Stewart Park in Wilson, same place. And um, yeah, that's all my comment tonight, thank you. And now the board is going to take a 10 minute break.